Hi, my name is Beth, and I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and I struggle with codependency, self-worth, and eating disorders. So when I decided to write my story, I went out and I bought a box of Little Debbie snack cakes. I figured the least that she could do is help me rewrite my story. I can't say that my childhood was anything out of the ordinary. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. Dad worked as hard as he could to provide for our family, and there were three of us kids. I was the oldest by one minute. I have an identical twin sister named Emily and a younger brother named Brian that y'all just met. When I introduced myself, I named three specific areas of struggle. These three struggles are rooted in my childhood, as many hurts, habits, and hang-ups are. They stay with us until we learn to surrender them to Jesus, and I want to share them with you individually. First is self-worth. Life growing up with a sister is great, and I have the privilege of being gifted with an identical twin. It's a built-in best friend for life, an instant companion for all of the ups and downs that come your way. Emily was more outgoing than I was, and that was okay because we were a package deal. Emily did all the talking, and once she got her foot in the door, we were both in. I was extremely shy, and I enjoyed letting her take the lead. Having a twin is a novelty. People love to check us out and see if they can tell us apart. Okay, which one's Beth and which one's Emily? There could be a hundred women in the room, and you are automatically compared with your twin, and only your twin. Oh, look at the twins, aren't they cute? Who is the oldest? Who's the meanest? How can I tell you two apart? And this is when the comparisons start. People want to be the one that can figure out how they can avoid mixing you up with your twin. They begin assessing for differences or variations to determine who is who. And during the detailing process, a pattern emerged. I would be labeled the chubby one, the one with the round face, the heavy set twin. Oh, Beth is bigger than Emily. That's how I can tell them apart. Folks would be rather proud of themselves for pointing out that I was about 10 pounds heavier than my sister. Family and even total strangers would make the same assessments and comment on their findings. I was not an overweight child, but I was bigger than Emily, and that was my identity. I saw myself as the less desirable twin because I was the heavyset, round-faced one. This negative assessment made me feel rejected and less than. I felt like Emily was being chosen over me. And of course, society tells our girls that being fat is a bad thing. You need to be thin and beautiful to be successful and accepted. Even as adults, Emily and I will be compared using this awful tactic. I learned early to be a shadow of Emily. I wanted to avoid the feeling of being rejected and compared as someone who is not as perfect as my sister. As a child, I just wanted to be unnoticed. I didn't want to draw any unnecessary attention to myself, so I didn't have to listen to those negative comments. I wanted to be a good kid, and I hated getting into trouble. That was usually Emily and Brian's department. They loved to annoy each other, but I found that being good wasn't good enough. My father went into the used car business when Emily and I were young teens, and our job was to wash and clean vehicles to get them ready for resale. And when I say used, I mean used and abused. We would spend hours washing and waxing, scrubbing inside and out. And when we thought the job was done, we would find dad for an inspection. And we never passed. He only offered harsh criticism and questioned our judgment. We weren't trying hard enough and our best efforts looked like crap. Dad didn't mean to be so hard. He was under a lot of stress himself. But those words planted themselves deep in my being. I would never pass inspection, no matter how hard I tried. My best always fell short. I was the chubby twin who wasn't good enough. For me, it was more rejection. Second, the eating disorders. So now for the Little Debbie snack cake story. It's the story of innocent bannering among siblings but the devil will use any opportunity he can. Don't ever underestimate that. Our mom kept snacks in the cabinet beside the fridge, and one day Emily was in the cabinet to retrieve herself a little Debbie treat when she realized that there was an empty box. She immediately yelled at me, Beth, why did you eat the last snack cake? Currently sitting in front of the TV, I paused for a moment pondering her question. Did I eat the last snack cake? Was it possible I left an empty box in the cabinet? Everyone knows an empty box goes in the trash. I would never leave an empty box in the cabinet. 
And as I was still thinking it through, I heard my brother Brian chime in. Yeah, Beth, you ate the, the last one, and you probably ate the whole box. And then Emily countered, yeah, Beth, you ate them all. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Emily and Brian always fought with one another, but not me. I remember feeling ashamed, helpless, and rejected. Emily and Brian must have thought I was so greedy and selfish to eat the whole box of snack cakes by myself. They were picking on me because I was the heavyset twin with the round face. I think I was 11 or 12 at the time, and I was afraid if anyone else ever saw me eating a snack cake, they would think I was selfish and lazy too, just like Emily and Brian did. So I decided I would never be caught in this situation again, and I didn't. I decided I would reject those Little Debbie snack cakes. It would be more than 15 years before I would eat another one. For me, this was the start of controlling food. And then when I was in high school, I was a senior sitting at a lunch table staring at a pack of Lance crackers. They were staring back at me. And suddenly I realized I didn't have to eat the crackers if I didn't want to. Who would know? It was a little six pack of crackers. I could eat one or two of them and throw the rest away. I felt brilliant in that moment. I could control how many crackers I ate if I ate any at all. After that day, I began skipping meals or severely restricting what I did eat. This also began the constant thoughts of, what will I eat for dinner if I have this for lunch? I can't have cake today because I have to go to a birthday party tomorrow. Thinking about every bite of food and trying to balance it all out, I began to lose weight, and soon it was harder for friends and family to tell the twins apart, and I loved it. Third, my codependency. Shortly before the cracker epiphany, I met a guy. In April 1991, he moved from West Virginia into the house next door. He was 17 and I was 15. He was tall, skinny, and had long blonde hair, and he could ride a bicycle like nobody I had ever seen. He moved to North Carolina to stay with his aunt and uncle for a while. He was having trouble back in West Virginia. Little did I know the trouble he was leaving behind, including a one-month-old daughter. We started dating. Dated through high school, and I got married to him in 1995 at the age of 19. I never met anyone like him. He was a salesman for sure, never met a stranger. He was good at manipulating people, and he called it being persuasive. I noticed he would often elaborate on truths, and then I began to realize many statements were just lies. I was told very frankly that I was not to disagree with him in public, no matter what he said. I was to back him. No exceptions. When I found myself in those situations, I would usually just nod. I didn't want to verbally condemn myself when I knew the truth was not being told. I was still very shy and didn't enjoy engaging others, so the quieter I was, the better. We had two beautiful children, the oldest a girl born in 1999 and the youngest a boy in 2003. Being married to him was like riding a roller coaster with no harness or seat belt. I never knew what was around the next corner. We were separated twice before the third and final separation. It was to the point I did not want to come home after work. I just wanted to stay on Highway 70 and ride until it ended. I was working as a night shift nurse at the time, and when I would come home, the ex wouldn't let me sleep. He wanted to talk. I wanted to, I wanted to, to get help, but he said I was being selfish and only thinking of myself. At one point, I was so tired and overwhelmed, I thought about hanging myself from this enormously beautiful oak tree down the road from our house. However, none of these were options. I wasn't going to run away or end my life. I knew that God had a plan for me, and I couldn't let the devil win. Plus, I had two wonderful children at home I needed to take care of, and I needed to be there to make sure my ex didn't actually hurt anyone. I found myself in the unwanted role of security guard. I felt like I had to protect the world from him and on the flip side, not let the world find him out either. I thought if I could do things better, maybe he would be happy. If I agreed for him to do this or do that, maybe he would find peace. I loved him and I wanted him to love me. He had more than one affair while we were married. He confessed to a couple of them, even showing me pictures of his lady friends. And each time he would ask for forgiveness and promise it would never happen again. I would forgive him and pray for God to set us on the right path. But rumors of infidelity continued. And if I asked him about the rumors, he would tell me I needed to get over the past and just trust him. As the years ticked by, his behavior became more unpredictable and erratic. I would tell him that the only predictable thing about him was that he was unpredictable, and he thought this was a badge of honor. 
We were married for 23 years, and in that time, we had 10 houses and over 120 vehicles. I would joke with him that I was the only thing he wanted to keep, and he often told me I was beautiful. He would tell me he was glad I was his wife, and he was proud I was a nurse. But these sweet sayings would always come with a counterbalance. Once I was humming to a song in the car, and he looked at me and asked, are you humming? I said, yes. And then he told me that when he was a kid, he had to ride in the back seat of the car on trips with his cousin. His cousin would hum to the songs. He hated the humming. He told me he would beat his cousin to make him stop. He told me that's why I needed to stop humming. On another occasion, he told me he could hear me chewing my food. He looked at me across the kitchen island top and said to me, you know that disgusts me. I can hear you chewing. My twin sister and I were neighbors. We built houses side by side, my dream come true. She was going to come over in the summer and hang out in the pool. We could just walk over and hang out. It would be awesome, and none of these things ever happened. Shortly after completing the house, my ex erected a fence right down the property line. He said he couldn't stand to look over at my sister and brother-in-law's house. He said it made him sick to his stomach. He would tell me, I want to go over there and be the devil. If you weren't here, I would be the devil I want to be. And if you ever leave, I can't promise you anything. I don't know what will happen. I would tell him not to say these things to me, but he insisted that I needed to hear it. He was becoming hard for me to deal with. And these are just a few examples of my everyday life. I knew I needed help. Emily and Brian had been coming to a recovery program at Temple on Friday nights. And the ex told me it was a cult and I shouldn't go. My brother Brian was given his testimony the first time I came to Temple. Emily and his wife, Kat, introduced him to the stage. And as I sat in my seat, I felt so alone. I wanted so desperately to be on the stage with them. I felt I wasn't part of the family anymore. I felt rejected. My ex never wanted to go to family functions, and if I went, I had to listen to him degrade my family when I returned home. And it was to the point I didn't want to go either. It wasn't worth the trade-off. Brian gave his testimony, and I was so proud of him. God had done a miracle in his life. So in true codependent fashion, I decided I was going to help fix my ex. I started going to temple every Friday night. I would invite him to come as I pulled out of the driveway, and he would decline. After the third or fourth invite, he had had enough. He told me Saturday morning that he had had a dream. I kept inviting him to temple, and he bit the lips off my face. Stop asking me to go to church was his message. I did not ask him again. I had been going to Temple about four months in my quest to find a fix when he announced to me that he wanted a divorce. The day he told me he wanted a divorce, I remember very vividly we were sitting in my Jeep. Tears of hurt and pure agonizing heartbreak streamed down my face. And at the time, I was thinking to myself, oh my God, he's going to let me go. I'm going to get out of this. I'm really going to be free of all of this. I found out the next week he was announcing to his co-workers that the divorce was final and he was already single, showing off pictures of his new girlfriend. I knew my 23-year marriage was really over this time, and I was going to need God's help. I had tried everything I knew possible to make it work, but my best wasn't good enough. I had no control over the situation. I moved out of the house. I did not want to stay there. The kids were 19 and 15 at the time. The new house we built beside my sister was soon sold. The kids came to hang out with me a few times at my little rental house, but they were not happy with me for leaving. Their dad had already prepared them that I was going to leave before he even told me that he wanted a divorce. Only a month into the separation, they announced to me that they would not be back to my house and didn't know when they would see me again. That night, they blocked me on their phones, and that's been it. I haven't heard or seen my son since May the 7th of 2019. My daughter sent me an email shortly after that night asking me to stop texting them or trying to make contact. She said she wasn't ready to continue a relationship with me. And my kids' rejection has been the most heartbreaking rejection of all. To be rejected by my own children is a pain like I have never felt before. I had done my absolute best to shelter them from the craziness of their father, and apparently I had done too good of a job. And this is where temple recovery became pivotal in my life. I knew I needed Jesus like never before. 
I lost over 25 pounds in the first month I was separated. Food was the only thing I had control over in my life, and if I didn't want to eat, I didn't have to. I could reject food just as I had been rejected. Besides, I didn't deserve to eat. What kind of mom has her own children walk away from her and not even look back? That mom doesn't deserve to be happy. That mom doesn't deserve to live. So a slow starvation to death would work fine for me. I believed I deserved to suffer, and that's what the devil wanted me to believe. I didn't deserve to enjoy food. So if I did, I would feel so ashamed that I would throw it up. I needed to show some, of, some form of control over my own life, and food was the only way I could. And I couldn't gain weight because I didn't want to be the fat twin. It took me a few months to realize that my kids were out of my hands. It doesn't matter what I do or how much I eat. The hardest thing I have ever done in my life is give my kids to God. I know he has them, and he loves them more than I do. The waiting is heartbreaking, and it can be overwhelming. Psalms 5, 1 through 3 says, O oh Lord, hear me as I pray. Pay attention to my groaning. Listen to my cry for help, my King and my God. For I pray to no one but you. Listen to my voice in the morning, Lord. Each morning I bring my request to you and I wait expectantly. And I pray this every day. And I am still waiting expectantly. One night I was sitting on the floor in my bedroom a few months, after a few months had gone by with no contact, contact from the kids. And I was battling with self-worth and the heartbreaking rejection from my children. As I sat in the deafening silence of my house, I held my gun. It was fully loaded and chambered, and the safety was off. I sat with that gun for over an hour. The cold metal was warm. As a hospice nurse, some days at the inpatient unit, I felt like I was surrounded by death. So I am not afraid of death. So I just sat there waiting, pondering all the what-ifs. And then a still small voice, the Holy Spirit, said to me, This is not the plan I have for you. And that was enough for me. I knew God was not done with me yet. I got up off the floor and I put the gun away. I have no intentions of leaving this world on the devil's terms. God has a promise and a future for me. And I will see it come to pass. Isaiah 57 says, For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confused. Therefore I have set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. God has already reconnected me with my family. He brought people into my life who care about me and love me. My sponsor, Tiffany, is my guardian angel on this earth, and I know she has my back and is only a heartbeat away when I need her. My built-in best friend that God gave me as a twin sister has been my rock. Brian and Kat have also been there every step of the way. They have all cried with me and prayed with me. God also saw fit to place a God-fearing, Jesus-loving man in my path. <laughs> my brother-in-law hinted around with my sister that this man might be a good match for me of course I have read the statistics of women who end up in relationships with the same type of men over and over and I didn't want any part of that the night I figured out who the man they were talking about was he gave his testimony I heard all about his past downfalls and how God had brought him to North Carolina I heard his heart for Jesus and I knew the Holy Spirit was saying to me there he is. That's your future. I knew he was solid in every way, and Rich has been a gift from God to me. While Rich and I dated, we observed God's law, and now we are married. God is going to restore the years that the locusts have eaten. We even bought the lot on the other side of my sister's house. <laughs> So we're going to be neighbors again after all. Tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. <laughs> uh, and Rich, he has shown me what true love is. He loves me unconditionally and he supports me in every way. And most importantly, that man prays for me and he prays with me. When I started recovery at Temple, I immediately knew I wanted to be involved and stand with my family to go after that one more, and it's all coming to fruition. The picture did not look like I thought it was going to, but my God made it even better. Psalms 37.5 says, Commit everything 
that you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. I committed to a step study and God used those ladies to minister me to me in my darkest hours. I'm currently in another step study because I haven't arrived yet. So I'm pretty sure there'll be a third one in my future. God's work is never done. I am still in recovery. I am still waiting on my kids. I refuse to give the devil place. My favorite verse in the Bible is Psalms 156. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And it doesn't matter what the situation looks like. It doesn't matter how good or how bad things are. God deserves my praises, and he has a plan for me. As I fill my heart with his, and fill his heart with my word, it takes over all of those negative what-if thoughts about my kids and food. I still struggle with missing my kids and those swirling thoughts about food, but I trust God won't let me fail. I have Psalms 143.8 taped on my bathroom mirror. It says, let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. And I do trust God with my life, with every breath he allows me to breathe. I know he will show me the way I should go. God set me free like a bird out of a cage, and I am ready to fly. Thank you. He promises that he will never leave me nor forsake me, and he will never reject me because I am a child of God. Thank you for letting me share.